everybody. Welcome, welcome. We're really excited about today. This is JSA TV and JSA Podcast, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Jamie Scott Okataya, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, welcome to our very first JSA Virtual Roundtable of 2020. It's part of our monthly broadcast. We've been honored to host for several years now. But new for 2020, we are providing the very first 100 registrants with lunch on JSA. And so I'm hoping you guys have received your lunch and you're enjoying it right now. And we're excited to say folks are hungry in our industry. We have uh, nearly 200 registrants tuning in live today. Uh, so thanks everyone again for joining. This is exciting. And in true roundtable style, we want to hear from you. We want you to weigh in, have any questions for our panelists. Go ahead and type the question into our chat box. And if we have time at the end, we'll definitely uh, take a question or two. So uh, thanks in advance. And also, if you have a speaker suggestion for next time, or to check out our upcoming uh, monthly topics and speakers, or to register and score some lunch for next time, please check out our brand new website, jsa.net. So let's get started. Today's topic, and firstly, one of our most popular ones, is data center telecom and technology forecast for 2020 and like every january we bring in our predictions king if you haven't checked out his december post on his predictions for the industry totally recommend it but of course i'm talking about our all-star rob powell he's come back to be our guest editor and chief founder telecom ramblings you know him we all know him our his our our industry loves his top blog we we read it all the time here at jsa for sure um, so anyway, Rob, I know we have an all-star lineup here from three absolutely innovative companies. The floor is yours, my friend. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, welcome to everyone. And uh, thank you, Jamie, for hosting this uh, ongoing series of roundtables. I always enjoy the, the chance to moderate one when I can. It's, uh, I probably need to do more than one each year, you know. <laughs> uh, we are now a few weeks into 2020. Uh, there's another 11 months to go. and uh, Today's roundtable will explore the trends ahead for the data center, telecom, and technology sectors. And uh, with us today, we have three uh, distinguished speakers, and I'm going to have them, each of them, introduce themselves here. Uh, uh, let's start with the uh, Frank, Frank McDermott of Karma. Would you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm uh, Frank McDermott, CEO of uh, and co-founder of Karma. We build a SaaS uh, inventory platform that we deliver over Microsoft's cloud of the same name, also Karma. And uh, we build all of the outside clean, inside plant module services so that you can have the entire picture, whether it's data center, fiber, or say even wireless towers uh, built into uh, one single source of truth. And we have uh, Anish Patel of TBI. Anish? Hi, everyone. Uh, Anish Patel, I'm VP of Emerging Technologies. I'm relatively new to TBI, about three months, but I've, my, my background, my heritage is kind of in the sales engineering world as a leader, architect, or an engineer. Uh, my role, I have a key role at TBI, and that is to help our, you know, TBI is a master agent, to help our 3,000 or so agents and partners uh, drive technology solutions to their end customers, all the way from telecom to hosting, colo, DR, et cetera. And so I have an engineering team that really takes a, an agnostic approach when when talking to customers, um, you know, we have a portfolio of 140 different vendors, ranging from all the well-known telecom providers to security companies, data center companies, uh, managed service providers, etc. And uh, Raul Martinek of uh, DataBank, uh, tell us about yourself. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm, the, I'm Raul Martinek. I'm the CEO of DataBank. Uh, DataBank is a U.S.-based data center and managed services operator. We uh, own and operate 20 data centers in nine U.S. markets. Um, our customer base uh, spans from enterprises to network operators to kind of leading cloud and content companies. Um, and we're also part of the Digital Bridge group of portfolio companies, which includes cell towers, fiber companies, small cell companies, and other data center businesses. Thanks. Um, all right, let's just dive right in here uh, and start off with what we're supposed to be talking about, right? Uh, wh what new technology will have the biggest impact, do you think, in 2020? How and where will its effects manifest? Uh, let's start with Frank. Um, you know, I'm, I like to weigh in on the 
the technologies that uh, tend to fly under the radar, those very infrastructural, you know, change technologies that change how we work and how we operate. And, um, you know, one of those that I think that's really going to jump out and change the way, not just our industry, but everybody um, in the, the U.S. and beyond operates is going to be these um, multi-chat platforms that drive video. Um, just like we're on right now, you know, I think the novelty is ultimately starting to wear off. You've seen Slack, hip, well, hip chats at the platform because Slack beat them out, but then Microsoft Teams came in. Those are going, these are these sleeper technologies that are going to uh, come in and drive enormous video bandwidth consumption. And I know with our clients right now, we actually directly interface with most of our clients directly over Teams. And that's killing email. That's a huge productivity killer. That's the foundation of Slack. If you see, look at that on their um, webpage. And that in turn is going to drive all sorts of connectivity requirements on you know, the backhaul, um, fiber connectivity, fiber to the home, fiber to the business. Um, and then also drives continued um, densification of, for the hyperscalers at where all of these um, cloud resources re reside. So, you know, I think the big thing that's going to drive there is now video, video chat is not going to be a novelty. It's going to be a daily requirement and a daily way that we do business um, culturally. It does seem to be cropping up more and more for me as well. Anish? Yeah, I'm going to approach it from a little different angle. I mean, when, when, I, when I'm speaking to customers and partners, uh, you know, cybersecurity is kind of top of mind, right? Everyone is concerned about all the threats and sophistication of those threats that are out there. Uh, a lot of customers really don't understand from SMB to mid, mid enterprise, surprisingly, and even some of the enterprise customers don't understand fully what their risk posture is. Um, yes, they may have done some risk assessments in the past and they may have some controls in place to, to mitigate some security attacks, but I'll tell you, in terms of the biggest impact as far as new technology is AI in my mind, because the bad guys are getting better and better as far as the level of sophistication of attacks because they're using AI, right? And so, yes, you could put a block and you could put a rule in there to, to you know, identify a signature, but then they're going to morph that into something else, right? So that AI is going to be prevalent in, you know, uh, not only uh, with managed services providers, but, you know, um, you know, unethical hackers, if you will. All right. Ro? Sure. Uh, so, so in our case, you know, obviously as a data center operator, you know, we have a wide range of customers, like I mentioned, and ultimately, you know, they're, they're kind of mission critical applications and data live in our data centers. And one of the things I always look for is, you know, what are going to be the, as I call them, the, the net new workloads, right? What is going to happen in a data center that isn't happening there today, right? I, I mean, a lot of what happens in the data center today is kind of the you know, the business applications and social applications that you're kind of familiar with, but, you know, what is something new that we see showing up in our data centers and customers consuming? And, and for us, what we've started to see over the last, call it 18 months, is kind of the emergence, more kind of installations of, of high performance computing uh, clusters or, or, or platforms, right? So ultimately, a little bit of what the other side, what Anish said, it's like, you know, to leverage machine learning or artificial intelligence, you need to have these, you know, very sophisticated platforms. The leader in that space today is NVIDIA, which a lot of people know about as a graphics company, but they're really leading the charge in terms of machine learning. And these platforms then allow customers to actually do data analytics to get kind of those insights that are new, right? I mean, we've heard the uh, the adage that, you know, data is the new gold. Well, it's it's only gold if you can kind of mine insight out of it. So so one of the, the, the things that I think you're going to see in 2020 is just more and more adoption of HPC um, and machine learning. And there's a company that um, I think everyone's going to hear about in 2020 called Graphcore. Uh, it's a, a well-backed uh, UK-based uh, company, and they've developed a chip that is optimized for AI, as opposed to NVIDIA, that their chip was, was optimized for video rendering, and then they kind of re refactored it to be more about AI. So they're going to be launching in the US uh, in 2020, and we think that's going to drive the adoption of more of these HPC clusters and more of this kind of next phase of, 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 of the internet in terms of it being much more data-driven. Interesting. I'm going to have to look them up. I haven't heard of that. Um, 
Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a nice wide range of new technologies to look forward for the year. Um, let, let's dive in more, more into a little more depth. On, on what front is our cloud-based technologies advancing on the most at the moment? You know, wh where are people putting their resources and uh, what do they hope to get out of it? Uh, Frank? Um, I think the, the cloud tech, cloud technologies that I'm seeing are all driven, being driven by um, you know, the interconnection to get to those. Um, you know, since we focus, uh, ARM focuses in that layer one through three piece, um, you know, we're seeing that um, the ability to dr rapidly drive interconnects, um, first, you have to do that at a physical layer. That's where we focus. Um, and that's where a lot of that data is challenging. And it's, it seems like we've meet, reached a tipping point in the industry. Um, everybody's acknowledging that as an, an out, a piece of operational friction that they need to deal with. So that once you have that, that physical you know, interconnection in place, then you can start orchestrating and automating after that. Um, that's what drives you know, direct connects, express routes, you know, any, any flavor of cloud connection. And that connection is required in order for you to make use of those cloud services. So once again, you know, I, I go back to those foundational la layers of the inventory, or sorry, of the uh, uh, of the infrastructure, and you know, that's where I'm seeing a lot of attention uh, being paid at the you know, kind of uh, on the down level. Interesting. Yeah. Amish? Yeah, I see a large uh, movement in the voice space for businesses that are trying to move away from legacy traditional phone systems, PBXs, to a cloud-based, you know, UC type environment. And I could tell you from a TBI standpoint, UCAS is, is extremely hot. We've probably seen a three, four, five X fold increase just last year alone on just, you know, unified communications as a service. And we're talking about collaboration, rich collaboration features, you know, uh, messaging, video, texting, et cetera, conferencing, et cetera. Um, you know, and, and there's valid reasons why, you know, customers of all shapes and sizes are doing it. It kind of started in the SMB space as a cost-effective way to, you know, um, provide deli provide and deliver voice services and messaging and collaboration features. But a lot of enterprises were seen uh, adopt it quite heavily, and they're layering in like a contact center as a service as well to drive that customer experience. So that is a huge, huge area that we see in, in 2020 for sure. We're going to continue seeing a lot of growth. There's the market is definitely flooded with I'd say tons and tons of vendors out there. I mean, there's you got the Ring Centrals and eight by eights of the world and Bonages, but it, you know, there's 30 to 40 different vendors out there that are just offering a, a you know a UCAS type solution. And I think the key is but you got to find a vendor that not only has a UCAS solution, but you got to think about the, the the context center side as well and the CPAS side as well. Yeah, I mean, it's seen people like this is my phone right here. Uh, right. Everybody's going the soft phone route, um, and especially because we actually office out of a co-working space. You rarely see if, uh, an actual physical, like you know, old desk phone on right. anybody. So I, I totally agree with you, Anish. Raul, on what direction are you seeing cloud technology advance? Yeah, so uh, from our perspective, you know, two, in two areas. Uh, you know, one obviously, you know, the cloud is software, right? And ultimately. You know, I think there's a, a, a lot of interest, a lot of movement towards going towards more of these kind of, as they call them, serverless architectures, you know, things like containers, Docker, and and kind of Kubernetes. Um, so ultimately, you know, people are looking to be able to kind of scale their application uh, with the infrastructure being abstracted from the application. So that way it's more resilient. It's uh, it's more scalable. Uh, so, you know, that also lends itself to kind of, you know, what's happening. Obviously, you got, you know, three major cloud providers out there, right? Like Google, Amazon, and Azure. And, you know, as you know, all those platforms are, are, are in essence, proprietary, right? So these, so having these types of kind of orchestration layers and, and, um, and, and abstraction layers allows a multi-cloud type of environment where people don't feel like their data or their application is going to be trapped in one cloud and that they can kind of leverage um, you know the the tool sets that are in these other platforms so that's one one big thing we think is on the cloud front side and then the other kind of back to my earlier point is you know it's all I think data uh, you know an ability to harness data I actually met yesterday in one of our markets with a you know a major pharmaceutical company and they have a you know a chief data officer whose job is really to figure out how to kind of take all these silos of data and be able to you know 
uh, make them accessible uh, with analytics tools that will allow them to get insights into kind of their clinical trials and uh, the results and outcome-based medicines and things like that. So I think there's going to be a lot of a lot of data tools that um, are going to be very you know much more adopted, and then obviously these this platform architectures away from infrastructure based to kind of serverless. All right, yeah, big data. The all of you serve many customers who who are very interested in getting more out of that data, big data from via you know technologies like machine learning, AI, etc. What what else do you expect? For on that front, and what do you think that people will actually get out of those the, those advances in the coming year? Um, Frank, sorry. Well, the flip rail talk this morning. He's on a roll right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, look. I mean, I think ultimately everyone is kind of trying to use these new tools to you know advance their business, right? I mean, I mean, unfortunately, we were all we we're all old enough to have been around kind of you know with the you know 25 years ago, the internet came out. People didn't even know how to leverage just basic web technologies, right? It, was, it took a bunch of years for people to figure out how to actually leverage, you know, the World Wide Web to remember that term again to date myself uh, significantly. So I think we're in that same category with these new technologies that there's just there isn't enough, uh, you know, data scientists out there or, you know, now people get degrees in data analytics. So there needs to be a whole learning uh, from kind of, you know, how do how do you now deal with uh, this unprecedented quantity of data. I mean, there's just so much information out there. I mean, I don't know if you saw that there was an article in the in the Times where you can you can literally buy, you know, the GPS coordinates of, you know, millions of users that have been quote unquote anonymized, but it's super easy to figure out kind of, you know, who it is and they were actually able to do that. So all of a sudden you have these just incredible data sets about human behavior around human interactions, around use of phones, around use of applications, and people are starting to figure out, okay, how do we use this to a, a commercial advantage, right? Obviously, there's a lot of nefarious uh, things that can happen as a result of that too, which you know um, we're starting to see, as, as Frank pointed out, in a niche. So I think it's, I think everyone's going to just try to figure out how to how to leverage these technologies to further their business, and it's just going to you know accelerate the the pace of, of technology adoption. Yeah, do you know, oh, just go ahead. Oh, good. Well, I was going to ask Raul if um, you know if he's seeing the what what kind of you know investment he's seeing in his, with his clients on private clouds. Um, you know, I've, I've helped deploy a number of them. They're not grabbing as many headlines, I don't think, uh, lately. Obviously, the hyperscalers are, but you know, there there are some definite strong use cases around um, around private clouds as well. And I'm wondering if you're seeing those kind of loads come in, especially for storage. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Absolutely. We, we have, you know, we have uh, dedicated kind of private cloud platforms in, in, in about six of our markets. But to give you mm -hmm. one one great data point, uh, you know, recently it was announced um, and one of my, my former partner at Voxel, a hosting business, uh, Zach Smith started a company called Packet, which was a premium bare metal Yep. product right? so bare metal by definition is private right because it's, it's your own infrastructure you decide mm -hmm. to put a hypervisor on there or not but ultimately they got acquired by equinex which is the largest data center company in the world right so there's a really interesting marriage between co-location where you're kind of agnostic to the workload that's there and now in essence uh infrastructure as a service or private cloud right so my right. view is absolutely that you know um you're going to have a kind of a, a more heterogeneous uh, adoption of different architectures to solve different types of needs. And private cloud is one of the ones where, again, it's being used with all these other monikers, but I think it will become more and more prevalent. But, you know, again, the public cloud continues to, you know, grow dramatically. I mean, this is a, you know, um, a story of, um, of, of a lot of, a lot of boats being lifted by this technology trend. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just to add to that, I mean, pr private cloud, in my opinion, is definitely not dead. I mean, you certainly have a lot of use cases, i.e., a compliance-based workload um, mm -hmm. or a mission-critical workload. And, and a lot of customers think, hey, I'm just going to dump everything into uh, AWS, Azure, or one of the cloud service providers, and it's going to be cheaper. And in fact, in reality, it's not going. It is. It's not cheaper. Sure. Um, not when you get the yeah. outs. <laughs> What's that? No, when you take data out. Exactly. Especially. Well, yeah. Well, you got, you know, there, there's tons of issues, even just resource mm -hmm. usage, right? You're not optimizing your research, you just are not monitoring. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, at the end of the day, if you got those cyclical workloads and you need, you need a level of agility, then yeah, cloud service, a cloud service provider is great. But if you got a static workload that's relatively consistent throughout the year, a, a private cloud environment may be the way to go. Mm -hmm. And Raul, I just want to touch on some of the comments you're making. I think from a machine learning and AI perspective, the frameworks and the platforms that these big three cloud service providers are, are building, I think it's getting, you know, I wouldn't say, I, I think there's a level of ease to, to adopting it, right? Um, you still need a, you know, big data or a data scientist to leverage the platform or someone with somewhat, somewhat, somewhat level of knowledge, but you don't have to be a, a hardcore mathematician or understand the deep algorithms. I think the, the, the platforms that they offer machine learning as a service, whether it's through Google AI or AWS, are pretty good and you could just open the you know the the, the FAQs and really start using it. Do you guys so, think that those those machine learning and AI algorithms that people are developing within the industry are in, at a state where you know the various verticals and, and, and enterprises are really able to consume them or, or are we still waiting for them to mature? You know, my, my comment on this would be based on uh, some of the folks that I talk to that are our customers that are installing these systems in our data centers. And what they tell me is that the vast majority of kind of the advanced machine learning that's going on now is still kind of the, in the development phase. So these companies, you know, takes, uh, you know, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months to fully develop a production type of, um, you know, instance of whatever they're trying to do. So, uh, so I think, you know, we're going to, Whatever we see today, I think it's just going to be dwarfed by what we see in the future because it still feels like it's it's very early in its adoption cycle. Yeah, I would agree. And, you know, on that, we've kind of touched on it a bit uh, on the education and adoption front. Um, I don't know if anybody saw the news that Galvanize is also based out of uh, Denver here, one of the boot camp um, educators for you know, full stack development, including AI stuff, was just acquired for $145 million. You know, I think that speaks a lot to where we are, you know, kind of the future of the industry. We're gonna kind of have a, I think especially if you talk with the data center and the network operators, you know, we're kind of facing a little bit of a of Apollo program um, issue, you know, looking at a lot of retirements, a lot of brain drain, a lot of tribal knowledge, and. So, uh, you know, exiting, we're going to have to not just keep pace with the, um, say, the software side, um, like what Galvanize is taking care of, but we're also going to have to keep pace with the infrastructure and hardware side as well. So, interesting. Yeah. All right, let's let's switch gears here to a different topic, it, it, uh, it, but a, a, one that everybody is thinking about in the <laughs> sector. Is 2020 the year 5G breaks out into the wild? Is it the year? If yes, where and in what form? And if not, why not? Uh, start with Frank. Um, I, I think the main thing that we're going to have to see before 5G really takes off is we're going to have to address the fiber infrastructure necessary to serve it. Um, I think a lot of people, any, any kind of major market, they're seeing the, the precast footers with holes on top popping up overnight. And the one thing that I haven't seen, as fast as these bowls are going up, I'm not seeing any fiber infrastructure that's going in to serve them. And this has been an issue that I've seen in the past and during the wireless portion of my career. See people, people are gonna be motivated by their metrics. And if you see people motivated by a metric that says something to the tune of tower construction, and they're not subtly influenced to make sure that that tower is also on air and serving customers, that's going to skew the uh, metrics. I wonder if some of that is happening today. And without that fiber infrastructure, you can't light it and you can't start getting revenue on 5G. And I think that's going to be the big thing that hinders it this year. So I'm going to push, I'm going to punt on 5G and push that out to 21 or 22. Anish? Yeah, I would agree to your comments, Frank, to a certain extent. I think there, there are some you know, interesting use cases where 5G comes into play. I mean, so just something simple as, you know, you got a customer that's that has, a, you know, remote locations, each location requires, you know, two connections, right? You got a primary dedicated internet access and maybe a backup, right, as an example. That backup mm -hmm. could be, you know, a 4G LTE, or LTE connection where now you could displace that with 5G and you got that high speed and, and guess what? Now you could use both connections as active-active, right? And so you could do some pretty cool things with that versus having, 
uh, a secondary circuit idle, right? I think about alarm systems, um, you know, replacing all those POTS lines with, you know, 5G back, uh, 5G as the primary instead of POTS lines. Um, mm -hmm. I think about IoT, you know, IoT, in my, my opinion, really hasn't taken off. Um, but I think 5G will make make it mainstream, and there's lots of cool tech you know technologies out there like AWS IoT. Greengrass is a platform that essentially you know brings AWS to the, the cloud to the edge devices. So you got the software running on your edge devices um, that's you know running either serverless function Lambda, uh, Docker container, whatnot. It's collecting data, it's monitoring and filtering that data, and it's sending it back to the cloud. So there's there's definitely some use cases there where I think there'll be an immediate impact of 5G. Interesting. Bro? Yeah, so I, I tend to agree with Frank in, in my perspective. Uh, I mentioned about some of the other digital bridge uh, portfolio companies. One of them is, is Vertical Bridge, which is the largest U.S. tower in the U.S., and Hexanet, which is the largest private small cell operator in the U.S. So obviously their, their key customers are the four major mobile operators, and they're building a lot of the infrastructure that will underpin 5G. So you know, the, the state of the play today is obviously that there's more of a marketing 5G war going on now where everyone's kind of saying that they have 5G. But, you know, even T-Mobile that announced what they did at the end of the year, they're delivering that 5G over their low band 600 megahertz network, which means that ultimately just doesn't have a lot of capacity and it doesn't have the latency characteristics that they are. So one of the th big things on the horizon that's coming up in the next couple of months, I believe, is uh, what's called the C-band auction, where they're auctioning off a bunch of mid-band uh, spectrum. This is stuff that's like in the uh, two and a half to three and a half or four and a half megahertz range. Everyone remembers the company Clearwire. That's what they tried to do years ago. They were just, you know, too early in that adoption. Obviously, that uh, that a lot of that a lot of that spectrum is with T-Mobile today, but they need that that spectrum needs to happen and then to to frank's point you just need more of these kind of small cells and DAS systems because 5g has incredible throughput uh, when verizon did their deployment in minneapolis i mean they were showing devices that were getting 600 megabits to a device but that doesn't scale without more spectrum and without more of this kind of wireless infrastructure to propagate that RF when millions and millions of people are going to be using it. So even the carriers, if you, if you listen closely on their analyst calls, uh, like Verizon or AT&T, and, the, and they get regularly asked, when are you going to start generating revenue, meaningful revenue for 5G? There's a lot of hemming and hawing, and then it ends up being something around 2021, 2022. So I think the next couple of years, Everyone's going to be hearing about 5G, but it's it's not going to it's not going to really be very widespread, and it's certainly not going to be kind of delivering the, the quote unquote promise of 5G in terms of latency and throughput without a lot more infrastructure. Uh, to Frank's point, and I think the best I think the best argument for 5G at this moment is the IoT one, like you, like you both are saying, because it's even more so than the bandwidth or the latency, I think it's the addressability of how many devices you can serve, the density that you can get on the, uh, on each of those towers. So that's that I think is going to drive it. You know, with me, for instance, you know, even my home security system actually doesn't even come with a wire. To Anisha's point, it goes straight over 4G you know, over LTE right now. Um, and that would be anyone on here right now who uses Vivid for their security system. So that's been. You know, pretty eye-opening. Even you know, in a, in a market where you've got fiber to the home, they're not even assume. There are a number of companies that don't even assume that you will have um, a wire in the home anymore. Right. So it sounds like they, they can do a bunch of things for 5G, but they can't scale it yet without a bunch more work. Right. Yeah. Correct. I would agree. I definitely agree with that. All right. Looking be, beyond even that to a wider uh, uh, thought, you know, beyond the world of uh, cloud data centers and internet infrastructure itself that we inhabit here, the rest of the world seems like it's going to be a bit of a turbulent place in 2020, whether you're talking politics, trade, coronaviruses, et cetera. Do you, do you see any outside events on the horizon that could have a big effect on the industry that, that as a whole? Uh, Frank? You know, I'll, I'll circle back to, I think it was Anisha's com uh, comment earlier, not just on data, um, but data privacy. Um, I think we have gone, uh, as a whole, the, the general population has been pretty complacent because I don't think they've, I don't think anybody's really felt a true impact. Um, 
And to Rel's, uh, I think it was Rel's point on the, or it's just the, on the AI, mix the politics with the data aggregation, breaking down silos, and then putting bad actors in. Um, I think this year, particularly this summer, is going to be the time where hostile state and non-state actors get really aggressive and let loose all of their plans from the last four years. And that could be per perhaps economically or politically um, or socially crippling. So um, I'd be very much on the lookout for what's going to happen, data privacy, data breach wise. And if um, we see anything in the US as a response similar to GDPR or the California regulations. Interesting. Anish? Yeah, I think about uh, Brexit and the impact it's going to have in the data center market in the, in the UK, right? I mean, it's, you know, uh, I, th I think the date of January 31st where the U UK is going to break. Yeah, exactly, right? So, yeah, that's right. <laughs> where they're going to break it's apart, but it's going to have until the end of the year, right? To, to fully break apart. But, you, you know, I see, I see kind of two concerns. One, from a data center perspective, is making sure you have affordable uh, electricity. So if, I'm not sure if you guys know, but a lot, some of the electricity that UK buys is from the EU. So with um, you know with changing ex exchange rates between you know the pound and uh, the euro, that could be a problematic. And then you also got to look at, uh, and Frank touched on this a little bit, is the, the whole data data um, privacy, data flow side of things as well. I think customers will have to rethink their DR strategy. You know, if they have a multi data center environment, UK and some data centers in, in Europe as well, you know, how do, how do you, how does that DR strategy change? And then how do you get that data back from, you know, the EU data centers into UK as well? So there, there's still a lot of complexity involved. And I don't think, you know, even if you take the rest of the year, it's still going to be challenging. All right. Raul? Well, uh, so in my view, you know, you know, we're uh, what ten years into the longest uh, expansion in in U.S. history, or I think, or you know, or certainly in recent history. Um, you know, along with that, we obviously know, you know, this is unprecedented <clears throat> time from interest rates perspective and kind of access to capital, right? So um, everything we've been talking about today, you know, to to kind of 5g or the cloud i mean this requires just a, a billions and billions of dollars right so in my view anything that you know if, if we do you know there was some recession fears earlier uh, uh earlier last year and now it seems to be abated a bit but ultimately you know access to capital is 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 the lifeblood of this industry because you know these investments aren't short-term investments they're very long-term investments so i think anything that could kind of Derail that could um, could slow down uh, the the pace of some of these adoptions because again, just um, you know going back to 2008, uh, I remember in 2008 I was working for a, a private equity fund and um, we had a term sheet from uh, SoftLayer, which at the time people remember was one of the emerging companies that got bought by IBM and became their cloud. But this is a great great company and. You know, as as my my boss said at the time, you know, the price of money is infinite. So they, there was no deals going on. So I think that um, you know the continued kind of rosy outlook that we have here from a from a, a economic perspective, um, if that gets um, derailed because of some of the events that you mentioned, Rob, that would that would have an impact. Great, interesting. Um, all right, so it's time to put you all on the spot. Um, can you give us one concrete prediction? of something you will think that will happen in the data center telecom and tech space in 2020. Uh, any Anything goes, but you know, what, what do you got, Frank? Um, this has been a trend that I've seen, started seeing a couple of years ago, um, and I'm seeing it accelerate. I think this is the year where um, interconnect, interconnectivity and fiber access in, inside data centers um, becomes the main driver of valuations and deals. Um, you know, typically space and power has has driven the economics on uh, you know where to lo locate a data center, um, but that's fundamentally at odds with latency. So we're going to see connectivity, I think, drive a lot more of the equation, and I think you see this as part of you know every every data center operator out there that is interconnecting their their data centers. Um, because they're doing everything that they can to get as close to their uh, clients as possible. 
and take on as much of their internal uh, networking needs as possible. So that's that's my prediction. Interesting. Uh, Anish. Yeah, kind of tagging along with what Frank said, I would totally agree. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of customers move. Uh, look, uh, first of all, co-location market's going to continue to be hot, right? We're going to have customers are moving away from internal data centers and you know, dealing with all the headaches and managing that those data centers and moving to a cold environment. A public-private cloud strategy is what I see, so that hybrid IT strategy. I see a lot of customers, as they're transforming their networks and you know, um, incorporating SD-WAN into their networks, they're, they're rethinking how how and where the data where the applications live and you know what i see a lot uh, kind of a trend with at least our customer base is they're creating these regional hubs so let's create a, a data center stack in chicago where i live right so let's create a stack here where it's closer to all the i have now i now have access to all my cloud providers the big three azure aws google and others and that way you know low latency my application performs better uh, i have a single uh, cross connect or you know cloud connect into any one of those providers because you know, a lot of sophisticated enterprises, they're building their application stack. Half of it could be in AWS and the back end could be Google for whatever reason. Um, that's that's not unheard of. So now I have low latency between those two cloud providers, um, you know, leveraging my my uh, uh, IT stack, if you will. So I see a lot, a lot of that going on, um, those regional hubs versus kind of a decentralized, you know, um, or centralized location. And, you know, last thing you want to do is backhaul a circuit from AWS all the way to your corporate headquarters. Right. Raul? So um, I, I, I follow obviously the, the wireless world quite a bit. And um, one thing that uh, is out there is DISH, believe it or not, is, uh, has, is, is building uh, a wireless network, right? Uh, they have multiple RFPs out there for data center fiber for the, the core network. And that's is all part of the Sprint um, uh, Timo merger. What, one of the, the main kind of arguments why it's not going to reduce competition is because they're going to spin off a bunch of the assets from those two businesses, give it to DISH and um, allow DISH to become a competitor along with uh, the other three. Uh, but my, uh, you know, I think that we'll, what we'll see in, uh, in 2020 is uh, the cable guys. Um, uh, finally get into the wireless game you know they they all have offerings you obviously seen the commercials on tv but those are all mvnos aka resale of uh of the other carriers but i think 2020 is the year that they um do something with dish probably and and become an actual wireless or to the big three do you think sprint t-mobile will go through first before that happens or what uh it's 50 50. <laughs> So if it does go it through, then you anticipate that. You can, you can flip a coin, and um, and and that's probably how best to, you know, uh, lay the odds on that. Right. Well, yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> Been waiting to find out. All right. Well, that that's all the prepared questions that we have here, but we might have some from the audience possibly. Amy, yeah. we got anybody? We do. We have a question in. Um, it's on 5G. You guys started uh, uh, the boards up when you started talking 5G here. Um, and uh, one of our one of our viewers, Surinder Juneja, asks, how do you think the politics and national security concerns will affect 5G in particular? Oh, Huawei question. Huh? Yeah, I, I mean, in, yeah. The, in the US, yeah. I don't think it's going to make much of a impact because obviously uh, for a while now, Huawei has, has been banned from the big carriers. Obviously, now they're trying to ban them from all the networks. So, Ericsson, Nokia will continue to uh, supply the equipment uh, for 5G networks. Um, so I don't think it has any impact here in the U.S. I mean, there's a, a broader impact in terms of obviously uh, if 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 this bifurcates technology and we end up with kind of you know a Chinese uh, version of 5G, an American version or Western version of 5G, and what that does for standards and handsets and you know, lowering the cost of production and things like that. But um, I, I think the, um, you know, the the practical impact in the U.S. Uh, will be muted. Frank or Anish, you want to weigh in? I, I was going for the same angle that Raul did, so you covered it well. Yep. And uh, any other questions, go ahead and type them into that question box, guys. But um, we are wrapping it up it has been an insightful um 40 minutes here as oh sorry noreen just came in i, I uh, uh i love this you are a very diverse group i agree um 
Um, where do you see the revenue increases in the next 24 months, mobile, data, AI, AR, or still in carrier spaces? Well, I mean, a lot of those are uh, somewhat mutually or different categories, right? Um, you know, in the wireless, obviously, you know, one of the big challenges for the big three or four is that, you know, revenues just aren't really growing that much for an AT&T and Verizon. Obviously, Timo has been doing very well in terms of getting new subscribers. So that's why I think, you know, they're, they're anxious to try to figure out how to monetize uh, and drive ARPU higher for, for 5G. Um, you know, on the, on the, you know, the cloud side, it's, it's, it's just obvious that, you know, those, those platforms are going to grow significantly and continue to grow significantly uh, in, in the foreseeable future. Microsoft announced yesterday, I mean, their, their growth actually increased a little bit on, on the cloud side from, you know, 63% year over year to 64% year over year, which is staggering for, you know, businesses that are billions of dollars of revenue. So, uh, so I think those two silos are, you know, uh, very in very different states. Um, and then the other the other uh, areas I don't really have a strong opinion over. Um, I'm going to weigh in and say that the fiber operators are continuing to drive revenue. They're they're constantly building. Um, the fiber is going to have to happen first before 5G is a reality. Um, but every other part of our life is just touching more and more fiber. Every, every place all the way back to the home. Um, but uh, I think the business spend on um, on fiber is going to continue to is going to continue to accelerate, especially in metro markets. And Rick Talbot also has a question: Do you see low latency applications drive data centers to the edge of the network? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, you know we have a, a, the actual first production deployment of that from one of the big cloud guys. If you guys probably saw. A couple months ago, uh, Amazon announced uh, what they call local zones, and they announced that in LA. And ultimately, what that is is a, a stripped down availability zone that has been physically placed in a quote unquote edge market. I mean, most people don't think of LA as an edge market, but it is from the perspective of all the major cloud providers don't have infrastructure anywhere near the LA market. So uh, ostensibly what Microsoft, uh, what AWS said is they deployed this there because there's a big gaming community, big gaming kind of production, and they wanted to have that infrastructure local to that type of community. And with that, they did. A, they also launched a product called Wavelengths, which is a way for them to integrate that uh, availability zone, that local zone with, in this case, Verizon's 5G network and kind of claim that, all right, now you'll be able to kind of keep, keep packets in that same region. So, um, you know, this is, I think, something that, you know, we'll start 2020 from Amazon, uh, which has uh, indicated that they're going to deploy those local zones in other major metropolitan areas. And then I think once they do, the other cloud providers will follow because, you know, obviously it's a, it's a competition and, you know, it's a keeping up with the Joneses type of investment. Yeah, I think essentially what we're talking about here is edge computing, right, which is going to enable some of those low latency applications. And I think once we address the, the 5G infrastructure issues and the fiber issues that Frank and, you know, Raul, you guys are pointing out, you know, when 5G becomes ready for prime time, what you're going to see is a lot of these micro data centers pop up under the cell towers, right? So you've got an optimized stack of compute where now, you know, think about autonomous vehicles, right? I mean, each car produces like, I think it's like five terabytes of data per hour. There is no way you're going to send that, transmit that data to a centralized or regional data center for processing and back. The latency is just crazy, right? I mean, you could think probably 50 to 80 milliseconds or more versus if you have a, a micro data center under that cell tower, now you're looking at less than five millisecond latency. So you're processing that data faster locally and then transmitting whatever is necessary to, to the public. And I have one more question. Can you squeeze it in? Or is that too much? Sure. Uh, but a good friend, Curtis Friesen of Data Center Dynamics, asking how much involvement will or should the U.S. government have in adding to the extra infrastructure of fiber required for 5G implementation? Sort of going back again um, to to our 5G chat that Frank kicked off. Well, uh, let me. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, obviously, uh, look at your look at your mobile bill, and there's a charge in there, or your or your landline bill if you have one. Uh, but, you know, you'll see a, a USF charge, right? Universal Service Fund, right? So that obviously was 
it's a tax, right? It's billions and billions of dollars a year, and it goes to lifeline support, which is you know people having access to uh, phone communications. They're obviously in the process of trying to shift that to deploy that for uh, delivery of internet access, and ultimately uh, this participation. It, it, it's happening. It's called CAF now. I think it's a forty billion dollars over ten years or something like that, and it's mainly for rural areas. Uh, I saw one award recently where uh, when I did when I did the math, it looked like it was three thousand dollars per home to get fiber to those locations. So I think there is a role for the government to you know step in where there isn't enough private incentives uh, in other areas in in specific areas like rural areas. Uh, and that will obviously, you know, make it so that, you know, we don't have a, a digital divide and things like that. But uh, I think it's it's politics at the end of the day. So and it's our tax dollars. So you can rest assured it, it won't be done completely logically and it won't be done completely efficiently. Well, it's politics. It won't be done this year, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Ra Raul, I think you nailed. The, I think you nailed the point. I mean, because it's not just the technical issues of the digital divide. It's it's the social issues and. The, all of the social issues that come with the digital divide, and you know, it's. I think there's a lot getting these types of things that we've talked about, such as you know, video chatting, screen sharing, all of those things over Slack and Teams, like we just talked about. That that breaks down the the physical barriers of geographically separated teams, um, and can bring a lot of prosperity out to you know the. Um, to the rural areas of the country, and I think you know, coupling that with a good way to couple that will be with a lot of the renewable energy development, because when you've got those rights rights of ways open for utility lines, you know, power transmission, radial transmission, etc., um, for distributed wind, uh, wind turbines and solar arrays, you know, that's a good way to uh, to ride all of that, and those systems still need their uh, control circuits as well for SCADA and such. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a really exciting round table. I'm so sorry. There's so many questions on the board. Uh, we will capture them and and, uh, and and send you back some written responses. Uh, but thank you everyone for your participation here on our data center telecom and technology forecast round table, our first up for 2020. Our all-star panelists, thank you. Raul Montanek, CEO of DataBank. Anish Patel, VP of Emerging Tech, TBI, Frank McDermott, CEO of Karma. Thank you guys. And of course, a big thank you also to Rob Powell, founder of Telecom Rambling, for keeping us on point today. And viewers, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, you know, the, the numbers have been um, blockbuster for us, our, our best roundtable yet to date. Um, and, and if you were one of our first 100 registrants, we're, we're hoping you enjoyed your lunch on us today. And go ahead and visit us, jsa.net, to register for upcoming JSA virtual roundtables. We're rolling them out every month this year. Next one, February 20th, we're talking MicroEdge. Where is it and where is it heading? We've got a C-level roundup there from Edge Connects, Start Points, Edge Micro, and Edge Presence. So another roundtable not to be missed. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks for tuning in to JSA virtual roundtables. The playback of today's predictions will be available soon on JSA TV and JSA podcast that's on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, wherever you're going, we're there. All right, until next time, happy networking.